Welcome to Stuff They Don't Want You To Know. Today, we're doing something a little bit different. We're going to talk about one of our favorite episodes ever and one of our first. Dare I say, gentlemen, that this is a classic? <laughs> of the highest order. Don't call it a comeback. It's literally been here for many years uh, to the point where you can't even get it on Apple Podcasts anymore. So if you haven't listened to this before, this is your opportunity to hear it now, maybe for the first time ever. And if you have heard it before, hey, why not brush up a little bit on your Bernays? Because the man is a legend and influential in so many things that we encounter in our everyday lives. Ah, but without spoiling too much, we now take you in a time-traveling fashion back to 2013. Oh, what a glorious year. Uh, we, <laughs> it's, to, it's to the very first episode, as we said, of Stuff They Don't Want You To Know, the podcast, the audio podcast, where Noel Brown is on the ones and twos, and Ben and Matt are on mic. Oh, let's see what they have to say. From UFOs to ghosts and government cover-ups, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. Hello everyone, welcome to the first episode ever of Stuff They Don't Want You To Know, the audio podcast. Uh, my name is Matt Frederick. I'm the editor and producer on this show. And my name is Ben Bolin. I am, I, I guess I just write, do some research now. Uh, and you're, audio the, you're the face, man. You're the voice in the face. You're also on camera. I'm one-tenth of the face that you are, sir. But I like that position. Now I'm one-tenth of the talent. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> yeah. There we go. Uh, so yes, Matt, as you said, this is our first audio podcast this is a new thing for us because a lot of the other how stuff works podcasts started out audio and they went video yeah we're, we're reversing that process and hopefully it's going to be a, a highly lucrative process we're reverse engineering lucrative in terms of uh rewarding no 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 time. money all of the money we're going to make so much <laughs> money with this audio podcast it's crazy. People would laugh if they saw how much money we don't make. Yeah, exactly. That's how I explain it to people. But so we wanted to kick off uh, these audio podcasts by uh, doing something that's kind of show notes, right? Would that's, that be a way to look at yeah, it? Yeah, this is kind of getting you guys to see the the behind the scenes of what we do every week on our show. Yeah, and in some of these episodes, we'll be talking about previous episodes we've done in our original series. Um, I guess in the future we might talk about some other things, topical events, updates on mysterious deaths, just to be a bit somber for a moment, Matt. It's frightening how many mysterious deaths there are. Uh, oh, certainly. The, yeah. yeah uh, wow. Yeah, you really did. You really turned a corner there, huh? Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I, I've, been, I've been reading some stuff lately that will come up in another episode, but, my friend... I digress. Um, can I tell you a story? Absolutely. Okay, it's it's short, everybody, so this the whole podcast won't be a monologue. Uh, mm -hmm. All right, so once upon a time, Ben Bolin, the, the younger tyke version of me, uh, was a huge sucker for advertisements. Now, when I grew up, my parents for a while, for a period, refused to get cable on principle. So, uh, and I'm going to date myself here. We had, you know, one of those rabbit ear antenna fuzzy screen thing just because I guess they didn't want me to watch a bunch of television. So as soon as I was around televisions uh, with cable and stuff like that, I went nuts for commercials. You know, I would see commercials for toys, of course. Every kid falls for those, and I would go nuts and bananas over that. But I'd see commercials for stuff that a six-year-old would not reasonably want, like a truck, like an actual truck. Like a Toyota. Like, like a pickup <laughs> truck, yeah. And I would go, you know, I should learn to drive so I can buy one of those. Oh, wow. And I'm, I'm six. And then, uh, an ambitious young man you were. And to be candid, a lot of it, stuff I didn't understand. You know, a lot, I'm, I'm fair, looking back, I'm fairly certain that I saw a tampon commercial and didn't know what they were selling, but liked the music and thought, yeah, I, I should find out what that is. I could get on this. I could I, get over yeah. and, and even now, even now I'm still, um, when I'm driving somewhere or I'm walking by and I hear the radio, 
Uh, I am that one person out of 10 who will hear, you know, a Burger King ad or something and go, when was the last time I had a Whopper? Oh, man, For, forgetting, they got you. Yeah, forgetting that I've never actually eaten a Whopper in my life. Really? Yeah, I've never That's had a Whopper. Believe. It's true. Really? Yes, dude. Scout's okay. honor. I might have to. All right, I'm going to have to get into you. I'm going to have to talk to your friends and figure out if that's a true story because the Whopper, man, you, you've got to have a Whopper before. Call the NSA. They can verify <laughs> my story. Well, for me, it was yeah. the Nerf Nerf commercials, mm-hmm. Super Soakers, anything uh, like laser tag commercials, all that kind of stuff got me. I was such a little non-military kid that the fantasy of having a gun that I can shoot, no matter if it shoots foam or water, that was my big fantasy. And I, those, man, those got me hook, line, and sinker. And so, end of the story, still a sucker about advertising, both of us, but I think we're very much more aware of it than we were in Vance. Uh, we we have done some cool experiments. This is something that's a, a great experiment for every listener to try. Pick a day, pick a day like a week from now, and say, from the moment I wake up, I'm going to keep count of every advertisement I see or hear. That's going to be a full day. It's it's so difficult to do so. It's like trying to count the uses of the word the in a in a paragraph. But why has advertising become so ubiquitous? Why has it become so pervasive? Why are, are we living in an age where everything can be for sale? Well, first of all, capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. I know. But there's one very important gentleman who has an influenced pretty much everyone who has worked in the advertising industry since the 1920s, mm. I believe. Mm-hmm. And his name is Edward Bernays. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, yeah, I should have said that more on, ominous. Well, here, just try it again. Edward Bernays. Dun, dun, dun. I changed up the sound. Effect. I still like it. Yeah, it was it was good. We'll keep that one. Okay. But, uh, but yes, Edward Bernays, this is an historical figure that you and I examined in our three-part series on Edward Bernays, known as the father of public relations, nephew of Sigmund Freud, uh, wrote a book called Propaganda, which is probably one of the most influential, obscure books in modern history. You know? Oh, yeah, it influenced a lot of people, uh, including some rather nefarious people like uh who was that guy joseph goebbels yes yes he uh also a member of the nazi party joseph goebbels uh followed the work of edward bernays uh, and used it to help some social engineering some marketing to win over the german public during the nazi regime's reign yeah but not just nazis uh his book the book propaganda really it delved into public relations, like Mm. we're talking about, and really advertising and how to kind of manipulate, not kind of, Mm. how to manipulate people into believing a certain thing, uh, manipulating opinion. Right. Yeah. And in our episode, we talk about some excellent examples of this. Let's see. Let's just toss out some examples. Uh, Bacon. He made bacon part of breakfast. That's crazy. He did that by, didn't he, he sent out a letter to... Uh, I guess physicians and inquired about well should should a person eat a light breakfast or a hearty breakfast? I mean again I'm distilling that, but mm-hmm. and most of these doctors and most of these physicians said yes a hearty breakfast you should definitely eat that and they actually cited eggs and bacon. Yeah, and the way the questions were framed in this letter, it was um, any doctor worth their stethoscope would have chosen the option B, the healthy breakfast, over whatever option A was. Maybe it was like shards of glass and nickels. I don't know. (laughs) But but the way he framed it was so clever that all of a sudden he had a group of medical professionals saying that you should have a hearty breakfast, and then they jumped from there to say that bacon was part of a hearty breakfast. But the whole reason he got this gig was because pork – uh, manufacturing and pork livestock companies. Yeah, the the Beechnut Packaging Company. Specifically, yes. The Beechnut Packaging Company uh, had a bunch of what we would call American bacon, right? You know, it's not the bacon that flies in the rest of the world. Mm. They had a bunch of this stuff, and they couldn't sell it. And so they con- contracted Edward Bernays to help them sell it. So instead of going with advertisements, he created an opinion 
that he could market and made it made it an appeal to authorities by having the doctor say it. And that's far from the only thing he's done. So this idea fascinates me greatly. The idea that uh, I'm not going to sell my product by advertising it in a traditional way. I'm going to I'm going to go around that advertising avenue and I'm going to b- make you believe I'm going to almost uh, incept an opinion inside of you that then will make you want to purchase my product. Yeah, absolutely. And I I agree with that because it's one of the turning points, I think, in the history of advertising. Now, of course, Edward Bernays, even though he's called the father of PR, was not the only person to do this stuff, but he was by far and away the most successful. Yeah, top of his class. Uh, another another example that we talked about in the videos was the Lucky Strike campaign, the ah, cigarettes yes. campaign, which you you might remember if you haven't seen our episode already. Uh, you might remember it from the Mad Men pilot, where they talk about Lucky Strikes and how it's toasted. Spoiler alert, I guess. <laughs> and right. just that uh, you know, it's a show that's really all about advertising. Mad Men is, and they chose in their pilot episode to look at Lucky Strikes, and to me, that's it makes a lot of sense when we're talking about this guy who is, again, the father of PR and advertising. Right. So Bernays uh, figures out how to sell how to sell cigarettes. The Lucky Strikes company asks him to make Lucky Strike cigarettes more marketable to women, right? Mm-hmm. And he looks into it, and one of the first things he finds, if I recall this correctly, is you got to change the color. And yeah, then, the green color yeah. he didn't like. And then they said and, – and the women – uh, that he was asking about this, they didn't like the color either. Not at all. So, so Lucky Strikes comes back to him and they say, uh, it's too much money for us to change the color, so make it work. And then this is brilliant. Uh, he links it to women's suffrage and he has fashion designers, again, appealing to experts, uh, declare that this particular shade of green, not any green, the Lucky Strikes green in particular, is the color of the season. And they're throwing uh, green galas. Yep. The, I, it's crazy to me. That kind of thinking is so outside of my thinking that it's hard for me to even understand. I, Just, yeah. you know, that, that kind of, for me, it's manipulation. That's what rings in my ears when mm-hmm. I hear that kind of thing. But it's so smart, man. You've got to, I've got to kind of envy the ability to do that. It's inception. I love that you say he incepted yeah. <laughs> it because he really did. And then, of course, fast forward. We don't want to just rehash the whole episode. Please do watch it. If please do watch the series if you haven't watched it yet. Yeah, but, we've we've actually got um, a a playlist on our YouTube channel. If you go there, you can watch all the episodes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's youtubecom slash stuff. We often return to the idea of Edward Bernays because the techniques. Um, the inception, as you said, Matt, mm-hmm. which I'm going to use for the rest of this no show. No problem. Uh, the inception and inceptive techniques there are still in use in the modern day, um, perhaps more so now than ever. What's the? There's a news station. It's like now more than ever. It sounds oh, like I know a what news you're thing. Talking. We should make that our thing. <laughs> yes, we should. Now more than ever. It's just that's all we'll say on the business card. Cool. Now more than ever. Stuff they don't want you to know. Now, now more, than, more than, ever. than ever. <laughs> but the uh, so the idea. Uh, what another example of how these ideas can be used? Um, we know that psychologically, as individuals, a human mind tends to seek consensus. A human mind tends to seek some sort of affiliation in a tribal group and some sort of place of power within that hierarchy or place in the right side of history. Mm -hmm. So of course, of course we're hardwired to want to agree with someone who's a doctor because they seem like they are of some tribe that has this knowledge and we would like to be favorably associated as individuals on a primal level. Exactly. No, the, one of the worst feelings is feeling as though you're, you're, dumb comparable to or Mm -hmm. inferior to, especially mentally, Mm -hmm. at at least that's in my life personally. Um, And so I can completely see why that would be just a human thing. And this is kind of a, this kind of a brain hack or a psychological hack to, to circumvent people's usual critical thinking skills this way. And we see it, we see it today. So often on the internet, people will say, well, I, uh, 
I saw this study that told me that avocados are actually the lucid dreams of watermelons. Holy crap. And, and you go, oh, okay, and study – Study becomes this buzzword, this magic base that people just tap in conversations um, to say whatever without maybe looking at the methodology, looking at uh, other studies that may have found similar or dissimilar results. And sadly, or I guess distressingly enough, it, it's, it seems even more common to have those sorts of appeals and – what I've liked about this episode, the the third part of the episode that we that we did was I I really enjoyed at the end. Usually, you know, we just give the facts and then we mm -hmm. say this is what someone believes, this is what someone else believes. Maybe it could be true. Here's some stuff for against it. But in that in that third episode, we actually stopped with kind of a cautionary note, right? Yeah, and, and we warned people to be very careful. When you hear someone just citing a vague study without citing anything else against it, you know? That's, that's a huge point. And that's why we've started putting in our episodes the, if you ever see the little black bar that comes up and it says search, and then I'll put the keywords in there. And if you type those keywords into a search engine, it will get you exactly the source that we looked at. And because we like this, we like to even say this, we question ourselves Oh, because yeah. we're we're going online and we're talking to people or reading books and we're getting information as well as we can, but we want you, whoever you are, to go and research this stuff as well so that you can really see the sources. And we also know something that I think is increasingly important. Watch out for appeals to emotion. You know, in uh, in our research on techniques descended from the original Brene stuff, we found that the same techniques used to convince people to buy cigarettes or to buy bacon can also be used to convince people that a war is necessary or just, or even made for a, a completely fabricated reason. Mm -hmm. And this, um, that we specifically refer to some episodes that occurred in the 1990s, I believe. Uh, but also, you know, it's it's very easy to incite the mob appeal when you when you again appeal to something that theoretically and on principle most people would be against. You know, mm -hmm. and it's strange because often uh, there is a contingent of people in the United States who would say that uh, the United States government is guilty of this. However, not that it makes it any better or any worse. Uh, this is a common game that countries and, and governments and even corporations play with customers and citizens and um, just regular regular Joes like Matt and Ben. So when you hear uh, a lot of insightful stuff and people are telling you very emotionally reasoned things and not really citing something that is concrete, quantifiable, falsifiable even, then you have to take it with a grain of sand or a, a grain of salt. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> Either um, way. Wheelbarrow of salt. Well, uh, yeah. So yeah. to that point, we this is one of the things we talked about in, I think it was the third episode, the Hill and Knowlton uh, strategies. Right. And they're the whole Nurse Naria, Naria thing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's exactly what Ben's talking about. And it was a corporation that was paying someone – allegedly $10 million to make up a story that was so, if you were against, if you were against that story, just like you said, Ben, mm -hmm. you're a terrible person. Yeah. And the story really did pull at uh, emotional heartstrings. This uh, nurse Naraya was speaking to, was it the UN? I honestly don't know. Okay. Where she yeah. Was I, we've got it in the episode, but in her speech, which was, disseminated widely across the Western world in the lead up to um, the Gulf War, mm -hmm. th this nurse uh, was saying that uh, Saddam Hussein's Iraqi forces were doing something um, ruthless, right? They were it taking babies. out babies. Yeah, yeah, babies in incubators, taking yeah. them out and letting them die. They were killing babies by taking them out of incubators, and it started up in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. Turns out 
that probably never, ever happened. And the quote unquote nurse was not a nurse. She was the daughter of an ambassador. Right. Which is still, we still have to tack in allegedly on that. I mean, she was, that actual person was definitely the, the daughter of the ambassador. We have to attach that allegedly tag on there uh, just because there wasn't much fallout from this, hmm. from this crazy, um, you know, at the risk of sounding callous, it's kind of a viral marketing campaign for a war. It, re it really was. And we see the same thing in other countries. One of the great things to do, excuse me, one of the stabilizing things to do if you are the head of a country and the people are unhappy, the people are rebelling, maybe there's starvation, inflation, quality of life goes down, is that you find some cause that everybody can get behind, whether it's the persecution of some other minority, whether it's the idea that there is an external threat that we all need to band together against. Um, or you can always just throw around that great word freedom and or democracy. Ooh, I wanted to talk about that. Yeah, uh, it gets me. It gets me when people say, when people can say, well, the facts may... The facts may not match exactly what I'm saying, or the facts may not be on my side now, but I know in my heart. I hate it when people say they know in their mm. heart. You know, I maybe I'm intrigued. At I least, know in my heart that the Whopper is actually a much better burger than you would like to think. <laughs> <laughs> maybe I should like at this point. Will the Whopper even match the hype? Oh no, not at all. We should point out we're not being paid to mention whoppers yeah sorry uh, we can bleep it out and or so it's just like the and then we'll bleep it it'll be redacted but then by this point in the show people wonder what we were talking exactly. about. exactly oh that is good well matt i wanted to before we get out of here i wanted to uh ask you a couple of questions about edward bernays if that's okay yeah absolutely all right so do you think that edward bernays should have made these discoveries or made these techniques? Should he have made them? Well, if Edward Bernays hadn't made these discoveries, I'm fairly certain someone would have, uh, just from the way psychology was moving at the time. It's, it's a hard question because mm. it, in my head, it fuels this massive consumerism uh, where there's a lot less production, creative production, and much more consuming. Oh, I see. From okay. a public standpoint. Yeah, I've heard that I've heard that argument before. I don't know if advertising can be can be linked to that specifically because advertising, you know, predates companies. One of my favorite early examples of advertising uh, was I believe I can't remember if it was ancient Greece. The beer commercial? Or ancient Rome. No, prostitutes used to have arrows on their sandals. In, in these, yeah, in, in ancient Greece. And I'll, I'll figure out the specifics on this so that when people saw them walk by, no. they would be able to follow the arrows to the brothels. Wow. That is 100% true. Advertising, I think, is um, a natural mode. It's sort of an attenuated or focused uh, method of communication. The, the idea that we can hack things um, or we can hack somebody's perception of it, has been approached from a scientific perspective quite recently in the story of human history. But people have always been trying to sell things. What I, what I think might be more dangerous to that point, and I do agree that it is becoming in, a, an increasingly consumer-based society rather than producer. I think the, the phrase that's been used by, I don't want to quote anybody, but the phrase is the feeders. The feeders? Yeah, uh, for just the standard public uh, <laughs> oh, man. consumers. That's, but, you know, that's fine. We, we can get into that later. That's terrible, man. But, yeah, I see that idea, but I think what's happening more is not so much based on advertising as it is the near continual sources of stimulation. Mm -hmm. but it's, it's strange. Um, I was talking to someone, gosh, years back when we first kind of started the show, and one of the things they said to me was that in the pre-digital age, the control of information was sort of a, a control of omission. So if, for instance, we had, if we were um, part of the 
government agencies obsessively monitoring Martin Luther King Jr., then we would just prevent that information by coming out by never disseminating the documents and by never snitching on each mm -hmm. other. But now in a world where there is this constant simulation, this digital age, um, it seems that disguising the truth has turned into inundation rather than omission. So instead of worrying about keeping one thing out, just put out 500 fake things and uh, see what happens. So I know that sounds ridiculous um, talk. I know we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, but that's something that I think Bernays would do. And I am not inherently against uh, advertising. I think people need to be aware of it. I think you're absolutely right, Ben. Being aware, just being a conscious consumer, because that's what we all are, just be conscious about the advertising that's hitting you and, and know that it is seeping in there somewhere, no matter whether you're watching it, listening to it, or both. And speaking of watching and listening, thank you so much for listening to uh, our first ever audio podcast of Stuff They Want You Know. We appreciate your patience as we work the kinks out. Speaking of watching, you can go straight to youtube.com slash conspiracy stuff to check out our episode of Edward Bernays. And uh, if you guys and gals out there are listening and you feel ambitious, then uh, we would love to hear you do this experiment with us. Pick a day in the future. Give yourself some time. You know, don't be drunk at four in the morning and say you're going to do it tomorrow. Give yourself a week. And then say, one day out of, out of this week, I'm going to count every single piece of advertising I see from the moment I wake up to the moment I go to sleep. I, I'd, be, I'd be very interested in seeing that number. And I'll do it too. Yeah, I'm going to do it as well. Great. So we're agreed. And you can tell us about the number that you found. You can also give us suggestions for an upcoming show. Uh, you can do all of this by hitting us up on our social media. Yes, you can find us on Twitter. We are at Conspiracy Stuff. You can find us on Facebook. We're also Conspiracy Stuff there. Or you can send us an email, a good old-fashioned email, to conspiracy at discovery.com. For more on this topic and other unexplained phenomena, visit testtube.com slash conspiracy stuff. You can also get in touch on Twitter at the handle at conspiracy stuff. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio.